The Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals heard arguments Tuesday on whether to restore President Donald Trump's executive order banning people from Iraq, Syria, Iran, Sudan, Libya, Somalia and Yemen from entering the United States. The case was brought by the states of Washington and Minnesota. The emergency hearing came just days after a judge in Seattle imposed a nationwide temporary restraining order on the ban. On Tuesday, three judges in the Ninth Circuit heard oral arguments via telephone. Two of the judges were appointed by Democrats, William Canby and Michelle Friedland, and one by a Republican, Richard Clifton. Justice Department lawyer August Flenchy argued Trump's executive order was constitutional. Under Section 212F, Congress has expressly authorized the president to suspend entry of classes of aliens when it is Debt, when it is necessary or when otherwise it would be detrimental to the interests of the United States. That's what the president did here. And the president's determination that a 90-day pause was needed for the seven countries at issue here in order to ensure adequate standards, and that's language from the order, for visa screening was plainly constitutional. The district's court's order, which contained no assessment of the legality of the order, was an error, and we encourage the court to stay. During his argument, the Justice Department lawyer, August Flenchy, questioned the role of the court in reviewing the president's actions. The reason we sought immediate relief and a stay is because of the the court's, the district court's decision uh, overrides the president's national security judgment about the level of risk. And we've been talking about the level of risk that is acceptable. As soon as we are having that discussion, uh, it should be acknowledged that it's the president is the official that is charged with making those judgments. I'd also like to uh, so are we back Talk to briefly. you? you I mean, are you arguing then that the president's decision in that regard is unreviewable? The uh, yes. Noah Purcell, the solicitor general for the state of Washington, said it was the court's role to serve as a check on the executive branch. It has always been the judicial branch's role to say what the law is and to serve as a check on abuses by the executive branch. That judicial role has never been more important in recent memory than it is today. But the president is asking this court to abdicate that role here, to reinstate the executive order without meaningful judicial review, and to throw this country back into chaos. To talk more about the legal fight against Donald Trump's executive order, we're joined by Lee Gallant. He's an ACLU attorney who presented the first challenge to Trump's executive order on immigration. His argument resulted in a nationwide injunction. Well, it's great to have you with Thank us you today. For me. What do you make of the court hearing yesterday? Um, you know, they were well prepared. I would say, listening to it, it's always difficult, you know, to predict what a court would do, but they gave, I think they asked very pointed, tough questions of the U.S. government, and in particular, sort of wanted to know, could they review this? Because I think that's the sort of takeaway from all this. Is the administration saying that the courts have no role? Because if the courts have no role, we're in a dangerous situation. And so, I think they properly pressed the U.S. government, what's our role, and are you really saying there's no role here? And I think— What do you mean by role? Right. And so, that they can review what the president did. There's no question that the president and Congress are entitled to some deference when they act in this area. But the U.S. government is coming dangerously close to saying, if the president says it's okay, then it's okay. And I think what you've seen from the panel last night, but also from all the courts around the country, is no, 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 no. The courts have the final word on what the Constitution means, and the Constitution is ultimately paramount. And that, I think, is what's been heartening about what's happened since the executive order. We went in within 24 hours of the executive order being passed, and by Saturday night, one day later, we had a nationwide injunction from Judge Donnelly in Brooklyn. And I think it gave everyone something to rally around that the courts were going to play their traditional role. And, and so that's what I, I think has been heartening about this, this last 10 days.
Let's go back to the hearing. Um, judges <laughs> William Canby, uh, he was a Carter appointee, and Judge Richard Clifton, a George W. Bush appointee, questioned Justice Department attorney August Flunchy on what oversight presidential orders can be subject to. This first is Judge Canby. Could the president simply uh, say in the order, uh, we're not going to let any Muslims in? That's not what the order does here. Oh, I know. I know. And the, 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 the order relies on. I know. Sorry, Your Honor. Could he do that? Could he do that? Or, That's not I mean, what the order anybody, does. Would anybody be able to challenge that? That's not what the order does here. Uh, I, know I do that. really feel. I do want to get to one key question. point. Well, we'd like to get to an answer to that question, because I mean, it speaks back to the standing issue. If the order said Muslims cannot be admitted, would anybody have standing to challenge that? Uh, I think uh, Mandel and Din give a route to make a constitutional challenge if there were such an order. It would be by a U.S. citizen with a, uh, with a connection to someone seeking entry. This is a far cry from that situation. Can you comment on this, legal art? Yeah. I, you know, the administration is trying to say, look, this is not a Muslim ban. The word Muslim doesn't appear, or Islam doesn't appear in the order. Well, that's not what the courts do. The courts aren't that easily full. What they do is look behind the face of the document. That, that's standard Supreme Court law, because otherwise you could have a state, the federal government, the president doing something with real discriminatory intent and then simply take out a few words. And I think that's what, you know, the administration ultimately was caught on that when former Mayor Rudy Giuliani said, well, I told them to, this is how to do it. Actually, I want to go to yeah. Rudolph Giuliani. Um, he was speaking on Fox when he made this comment. I'll tell you the whole history of it. So right. when he first announced it, he said Muslim ban. He called me up, he said, put a commission together, show me the right way to do it legally. I put a commission together with Judge Mukasey, with Congressman McCall, Pete King, whole group of other very expert lawyers on this. And what we did was we focused on, instead of religion, danger, the right. air areas of the world that create danger for us, which is a factual basis, not a religious basis, perfectly legal perfectly sensible, and that's what the ban is based on. It's not based on you... religion. It's based on places where there are substantial evidence that people are sending terrorists into our country. And this is December 2015, not a surrogate for Donald Trump, but Donald Trump himself calling for a total and complete shutdown of the entry of Muslims to the United States. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. We have no choice. We have no choice. So these statements might impact the court's ruling. Let's go to another clip from the hearing. Judge Clifton asking Department of Justice lawyer August Flunchy about anti-Muslim statements attributed to Trump and his advisers during his campaign. We hear first from the Justice Department attorney. It is extraordinary for a court to enjoin the president's national security determination based on some newspaper articles. And that's what has happened here. That is not a, a that is a, a very troubling uh, second guessing of the national security decision made by the president. And the notion you, that we are going to go back into the court actual, and. You, stop, stop. This is Judge Clifton. Do you deny that, in fact, the statements attributed to then candidate Trump and to his political advisors, and most recently, Mr. Giuliani, do you deny that those statements were made? Uh, Judge Clifton, I, I no. I, I would note that Judge Robart uh, himself said that uh, he wasn't going to look at campaign statements. Uh, I do, uh, and I think that what no, we— no, that, that's, what you see, that, that's, a, that's a different point. I mean, it, I, I understand the argument they shouldn't be given much weight, but— when you say we're, we're, we shouldn't be looking at newspaper articles, let's 
Now, we're, we're all on the fast track here. Both sides have told us it's moving too fast. Either those kind of statements were made or they're not. Now, if they were made, but they were made not to be a serious policy principle, I can understand that. But if they were made, it is potential evidence. It is a basis for an argument. So I just want to make sure I know what's on the table. Well, those are in the record, but I think my point is a little narrower, that in the expedited procedure of a TRO, uh, taking this extraordinary uh, uh, action of, of halting this order that the president determined was in the national security interests of the United States is uh, – is, uh, an unwise course, and it should be stayed. So that's the Department Justice lawyer, August Flenchy, uh, legal learned. If you can explain, because he makes the point, only look at <clears throat> what's on four corners of the document. Don't look at the campaign. Don't look right, at what people say. Right. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court has said over and over, you can look beyond the four corners of the document if there is evidence of discriminatory intent. And we're not talking about a newspaper article. We're talking about then candidate Trump's own statements, and not just one statement. If there was one offhand statement, you know, that's one thing. But it's over and over and over. And I think everyone knew what he intended with this executive order. The other thing I would point out that's getting lost is the order on its face discriminates among religions, not, not by denomination, but it does talk about minority religions and majority religions. And even that is prohibited by the Establishment Clause. The government is not supposed to be in the business of choosing between religions, particular religions, or even minority and majority. And after the executive order was signed, he very clearly said the minority religion provision was intended to benefit Christians. And in this country and under our Constitution, we don't favor one religion over another. I mean, that's the most bedrock principle in our country. So explain where this goes right now. They say they're going right. to make a decision. It could be handed down today, tomorrow, the next day. What does it mean? What are the possible choices these judges can make? Right. So, so one thing is they can just simply affirm the district court and say, look, we're going to keep everything on hold while this case moves forward, because this is ultimately just temporary relief. Then the U.S. government will have the opportunity to go to the Supreme Court if they choose. They'd be on a very fast track. I don't know. Everyone is assuming they will. I don't know that they will when serious lawyers look at this and see how little time there is, because the, the case is moving on a very fast track back in district court. If it's overturned, if the stay is overturned, Washington could go to the Supreme Court. You know, whether either side will remains to be seen. But ultimately, the case has to go forward, just like our case in New York, our case in Maryland, the ACLU's cases, and other cases. Ultimately, we're going to have to reach the merits of all this, because this is all preliminary skirmishes to keep the status quo. What this is all about is, ultimately, who's going to be harmed more during the interim when the case is going forward. I think it's very clear with refugees abroad or in real danger and all of the other harms that befell people that if you keep the, the executive order in place, people are going to be really harmed. The U.S. government could not come in with a countervailing harm, especially because all these people have been vetted. I mean, in our case, it was an, it was a, an Iraqi who helped our U.S. military. This and is the first case exactly. you brought racing to the Brooklyn court. Exactly. It was two men that you were representing. And, and on behalf of a whole class nationwide. And those were people who helped our U.S. military. But the government's putting out this, this narrative that we don't know who's coming in. But these were people who actually help put their lives at stake for our U.S. military, and then all of a sudden they're landing here and they're saying, President Trump doesn't want you, even though you put your lives at stake, at risk. So <clears throat> President Trump clearly is not used to having people review his decisions as CEO of the Trump empire. Um, so his first reaction was to lash out at the judge, call him a so-called judge. The significance of this very quickly, Lee? Yeah. I, I, the rule of law is critical. The, the president has to respect the courts. I mean, that it may be the overriding issue here. That's bigger than any particular civil liberties issue. Mm -hmm. And clearly, um, there is trouble um, uh, in the administration. You have the the lawyer, uh, Flenchy, being replaced, uh, coming into this at the very last right. minute, in the right. hours right. before he argued this, in this very odd telephone call, where one of the judges was, what, in a floor, was in Hawaii, right. and another judge. Everyone was in a different place, and this was argued over the phone. Um, he comes in, and when he's seeing he might not be doing so well at the end, he says, well, for one thing, at least don't allow people who've never been in the United States to come into the United States right. if you're going to make a partial decision. Sort what of, about that? Yeah, a fallback argument. I, I don't think it's possible 
to, to sort of split it up now, especially how quickly things are moving, how the administration would actually implement such a such a division between people and and everyone's being harmed. I don't think that's a wise course, but you can see that the government fell back on something, realized maybe they weren't going to get everything they wanted, and tried at the last minute some sort of fallback minor. Now, let me read you a tweet that just came out. Uh, Donald Trump didn't respond to uh, the hearing last night, but he did say, if the U.S. does not win this case, as it so obviously should, we can never have the security and safety to which we are entitled. Politics! Exclamation point. And then he tweeted, I will be speaking at 9 a.m. today to police chiefs and sheriffs, and we'll be discussing the horrible, dangerous and wrong decision. And he moves on. Yeah. We would prefer not to see the president say to the courts, if you do this, the whole country's security is on you. I mean, I think the courts are doing what they are supposed to do and looking at the Constitution. They are doing their best, and they are co-equal branch of the government.